So what I'm going to talk to you about is very rare. So you know, mesenteric occlusive disease is rare, and artery aneurysm disease is even rare in this um, group of uh, diseases. Most patients are asymptomatic, and these visceral artery aneurysm really typically found on, on sort of CT scan, MR, or even ultrasound um, that are done for other reasons, so really incidental findings. And still to this day, I think the etiology, the pathogenesis, the natural history of visceral artery aneurysm is, is not really well known, but it's not your typical atherosclerotic aneurysm as the aorta or the peripheral um, aneurysms. But it is important to know because it can be a lethal problem. Um, ruptured splenic artery can lead to uh, death in a you know, um, small number of patients, but it is important to recognize. So you've seen the anatomy of the celiac and SMA, and uh, there's a lot of collaterals. And this diagram shows where the um, common visceral artery aneurysms are. So most of them is um, in the splenic artery. So you have about 60% of all visceral artery, artery aneurysm is located in somewhere along the splenic artery. And then the second most common is uh, involving the common hepatic artery. It could be in the common hepatic or hepatic artery proper. And then less commonly, superior mesenteric artery. And then celiac and then the other small branches um, can also have um, aneurysmal changes. But overall, very rare. So splenic artery and hepatic artery are thought to be due to more of a medial um, acquired medial degeneration or medial dysfibroplasia of the splenic artery. Um, sometimes aneurysm can form after spontaneous dissection, or you can have traumatic dissection leading to aneurysm formation, and then infectious causes um, are fairly rare. And then in these aneurysm, you have secondary arthrosclerosis. So typically, you may see calcification form in the wall of the splenic artery or in the wall of big hepatic artery aneurysm. So of all visceral artery aneurysm, 60% come from the um, splenic artery bed. The incidence or the prevalence is really very rare, as I mentioned, less than 0.1%. And then what's also important to remember for multiple choice questions sometimes is that it is associated with other aneurysms elsewhere. 14% um, of all splenic artery aneurysm patients may have renal artery aneurysm as well. And uh, this is the only sort of aneurysm in the body that's more common in women than men, with a ratio of 4 to 1. And as I said, it is sort of more related to medial dis fibrodysplasia rather than atherosclerotic disease. Although in the textbook, you'll find that people talk about people being multiparous or women having multiple children as being predisposed to a formation of splenic artery aneurysm. I must tell you, a lot of the patients that I've seen for splenic artery aneurysm only had one or two kids. Um, anyways, but that may come up on your multiple choice questions. And then the portal hypertension also can uh, predispose to the formation of uh, splenic artery aneurysm in uh, patients with liver cirrhosis. Less than 5% of the splenic artery aneurysm referred to your practice later on will really go on to rupture. It is red relatively rare incidence. So, what are the indications to treating splenic artery aneurysm? Well, typically, if you find it in a young woman at childbearing age, and if the aneurysm is greater than two centimeters, then I think most of us would feel good about that being a, a true indication for, for fixing the splenic artery aneurysm because there is a high rate of spontaneous rupture in um, pregnancy. And then the other real indication for fixing small splenic artery aneurysm is in the patients with liver transplant um, because there's been reported higher incidence of splenic artery aneurysm rupture after um, orthotopic liver transplantation. Other than those two main indications, um, most splenic artery aneurysm don't really grow very much, and if you find them small, um, then it's, it's really a matter of just, you know, close monitoring, and close monitoring meaning one to two years um, of imaging to follow up these uh, splenic artery aneurysm. Um, the um, size that one look at as a real indication for splenic artery aneurysm um, repair would be at least three centimeter or greater, I would say. Um, some textbooks say two, but I, I find that, you know, in my own practice, I usually wait at least about three centimeter or greater in older patients, or if you can show that there's significant rapid growth. 
So how do you treat splenic artery aneurysm? There's many ways of treating it. Um, in the old ways, we used to kind of take the spleen out, get rid of the aneurysm that way. That's like years and years ago. Currently, there's multiple different options for fixing splenic artery aneurysm. It really depends on the anatomy. If you have a good neck, um, if it's a nice sacular splenic artery aneurysm, you have a good neck proslin distal. I think most people would try and attempt um, cover stent to put in to exclude the aneurysm. Um, most of the time, it doesn't really lead to a whole lot of endo leak because the branches typically don't come off that sacular um, aneurysm. And then people talk about laparoscopic um, sort of ligation of the uh, proximal and distal to the uh, aneurysm neck, and then you just simply don't revascularize because usually you have a good, uh, you know, good amount of collaterals around it, so there's no need for reconstruction. Um, but the key is really most of us now are now trying to preserve the spleen, so we don't want to, um, you know, cut off the blood supply to the spleen altogether. Some Splenic artery aneurysm have a very nice neck that you can core embolize. Um, the long-term follow-up hasn't really shown that it is a, a, a definite fix because there has been report of persistent flow into splenic artery aneurysm after coiling. So there's many options um, to fix this. This uh, diagram shows, again, the sort of collaterals around the splenic um, artery. We've gone over the anatomy. Um, now let me show you this case example. This is kind of an, an interesting case. This is a 52-year-old man who um, I was saw at MD Anderson. He actually has early pancreatic cancer, head of the pancreas, and he comes in with this big aneurysm. He's a very thin man. You can actually feel his uh, splenic artery aneurysm, which is located right there, right? You can see it right there, right? That's his aorta, and that's the splenic artery. Um, aneurysm. Pretty sizable aneurysm, right? So he actually came and he was shopping around different institutions. I think he was actually from China. So he came to see at MD Anderson and, and, and also went to a Johns Hopkins and he decided that he was going to have surgery at Johns Hopkins first and then come to us for his chemotherapy. So I didn't get to fix the aneurysm, but I'm going to show you what they did. Um, so at the time of the um, Whipple procedure, they went ahead and fixed that aneurysm as well. And you could sort of, this is kind of faded a little bit, you can't really see that well, but um, actually before I sent him back to John Hopkins, I thought, you know, maybe we could try and put a cover stent in that aneurysm. And I'm showing the CT just to show you that, you know, you kind of see the, this is a splenic artery aneurysm there, and you see there's a, quite a nice neck, right? So let me see. Um, now, this is the, uh, I was going to try and convince him to let us put a stent graft before he, um, decide to go to Johns Hopkins for his uh, major surgery. And you can sort of see the, uh, the angiogram. We came from the arm, and we tried to, uh, to navigate through here. And how many of you think you can put a stent graph in there? That'd be pretty tough. <laughs> It'd be pretty tough. So we actually back out. We didn't try. Um, and we sort of said, you know, um, we would be willing to just repair the splenic artery aneurysm um, at the same time that we would do the Whipple procedure. But he went to Johns Hopkins, and they uh, did their procedure for him, and then he came back to us after he's had his uh, surgery. He had a Whipple, and he had a splenic artery. They, essentially, what they did was they tied the artery um, proximal and distal to the aneurysm, opened the aneurysm sac, and then, um, you know, sort of over a few of the branches into the aneurysm and excluded the aneurysm just the way we do infrarenal aortic aneurysm. And then they pull the two ends of the artery back together. And you can see this is a, um, a splenic angiogram that we did about six months after his surgery in um, preparation for Ashley now because he's developed portal hypertension um, and he actually needed his splenic artery embolized so that he, uh, so that we can bring his platelet count up. So at this time, his platelet count was down to like 20 or 30. And we do this not not infrequently at Anderson where we actually would embolize the splenic artery, and it actually works to bring your platelet count up. So we embolize and infarct about 60 to 70% of the spleen. But I thought I'd show you this nice reconstruction that they did, you know, they try and preserve the spleen very nicely, and then we went on to infarct some of it, you know, so you never know. You never know with these patients. So this is a, another example. This is uh, about five years ago, one of my cases that um, this was a young woman who was of childbearing age, and she was very, very nervous. Her aneurysm was barely two centimeters, but I went ahead 
and convince myself that I would do her um, you know, a favor by fixing it. And so this is actually a follow-up um, CT that I did five years after we had put a couple of cover stents. And you can see the cover stents here, and it's not just one. We actually put in three overlapping ones because we had such a hard time navigating to the aneurysm, which was way close to the splenic hilum. You actually don't see the aneurysm anymore because it's totally excluded now five years after. But we ran into the problem with the splenic artery, you know, that's very tortuous. We actually dissected the artery a little bit. So had to put, you know, overlapping cover stent to kind of fix the problem. But it looks nice. It looks, you know, very nice, and we were able to um, completely exclude that uh, splenic artery aneurysm with the CT to show our results five years after. How about hepatic artery aneurysm? Um, this is the second most common type of visceral artery aneurysm. It um, happens more so in men, in men than women. It tends to happen in older patients, and um, about a third of them are associated with other type of visceral artery aneurysm. 80% of these are extrahepatic. Um, the rest is, can be intrahepatic. And uh, most of these, again, are non-atherosclerotic in um, nature. This is a, a diagram showing the anatomy of the common hepatic artery again. You have lots of collaterals, but this is the common hepatic artery. This is um, the hepatic artery proper. And uh, let me show you a case example of, um, of what we did in this next um, case. Actually, um, there's, people talk about this Quinks, Quinkies triad, which is the abdominal pain and right upper quadrant associated with common hepatic artery aneurysm that can uh, bleed into the biliary system and could cause hemobilia as well as um, jaundice obstructing the common bowel duct. Um, it's a very rare phenomenon, but it can happen, and this is in the situation in which you would have to uh, operate um, urgently. The indications to treat common hepatic artery aneurysm, again, um, only if it's big, and big I mean greater than three centimeters, although some textbook would tell you two. Um, I think most of these do not um, grow very much. And the uh, other indication for fixing aneurysm um, in the hepatic artery region is when it causes, it can cause portal vein um, fistula. The treatment, um, again, there's multiple ways to treat this. You can, if you have a nice good neck, you can um, coil it, you can glue it, um, and then you can, um, it, it would be difficult to put a, a cover stent because most of these are very short, um, but um, people have tried. Or the open repair really is reserved only for um, large aneurysm. The other thing you can do is typically you can coil the artery because of the good collateral flow and uh, not have to worry about ischemia to the liver because, as you know, greater than 75% of the blood flow to the liver is provided by the uh, portal vein. So this is a um, case of a patient who was referred because of a large common hepatic artery um, aneurysm you can see in this region. Um, he didn't have much of a neck proximal and distally for a uh, cover stent, and so we went ahead and fix it um, in an open fashion. You can see here is the um, sagittal view of the uh, celiac artery leading to the common hepatic artery. This is the aneurysm. And you can see there's not much of a neck here, and there's certainly no neck distally to put any, um, um, to really steal any stent graft. And this is, a, we use a saphenous vein graft to um, replace the uh, common hepatic artery in uh, this patient. This is a case of a pseudoaneurysm of the common hepatic artery. This patient had um, a Whipple procedure. And then about a week after his Whipple, he uh, started bleeding intra-abdominally quite massively. And we resuscitated him and took him down to the um, um, angiographic suite and showed that he's got, um, we sh uh, first we showed on the CT scan that he has this pseudoaneurysm um, involving somewhere in the uh, common hepatic artery. So we um, were able to selectively go into the common hepatic artery and demonstrate the blush um, in the common hepatic artery uh, pseudoaneurysm here. And we were able to coil it and uh, stop the bleeding um, effectively. So pseudoaneurysms after surgery or pseudoaneurysm from trauma um, is uh, typically something we can fix with um, coiling of those uh, pseudoaneurysms. 
SMA aneurysm is very rare, um, third most common type. And again, these um, shouldn't be fixed unless it gets really big. Um, and the treatment of it is sometimes you can actually just ligate without bypass. Sometimes you can bypass. Sometimes you need to bypass if you don't have good collateral flow. Um, endovascular stenting um, is uh, tricky, but it's uh, not impossible. This is um, a uh, image of a um, other cause for SMA aneurysm. You can see after a spontaneous dissection of the SMA, you can have um, aneurysmal dilatation. And um, this is not that rare, um, and you'll see more of these as we do more um, CT imaging for other diseases. And um, it's the difference between the aneurysm from SMA dissection is typically is not right in the ostium like your atherosclerotic disease. It's sort of just about a centimeter or two um, distal to the origin of the SMA. As you can see here um, is uh, the uh, dissection and the aneurysmal dilatation of the SMA. Celiac artery aneurysm, again, is very rare. Um, it tends to um, have other aneurysm associated with it. And again, the treatment really is, is observation if it's small and don't treat unless it gets above three centimeters. And typically, these are really not amenable to endovascular stenting and it would need an operative um, surgical resection or bypass. This is again a uh, example of a celiac artery aneurysm relate to perhaps a focal dissection of the celiac artery. So it's not right at the origin, but just a few uh, centimeter or two beyond the origin. And that's typically where dissection uh, will be seen. And something to uh, keep in the back of your mind, aneurysm can occur anywhere in the mesenteric um, system, and these are very rare, but it can happen in the GDA, uh, pancreatic duodenal, or IMA aneurysms also can occur. So in sum summary, visceral artery aneurysms are very rare, but it's important to remember because it, it can be lethal. Um, splenic artery aneurysm, treat them if it's two centimeter or greater in childbearing age women, uh, but wait until about three centimeter or greater to treat it um, in older patients. And because of the good collateral system, if you know, if you can visualize good collateral flow, then some of these aneurysms such as the SMA or celiac can actually be coiled without having to be um, reconstructed. And I will end there and take any question if you have. All right, thank you very much. That ends our session.